already said, welcome. Uh, my name is Craig Nisbet. I'm going to be introducing you to the wonderful world of freshwater invertebrates using the Field Studies Council Freshwater Name Trail. Uh, I don't know if you can see my camera at the moment, but I'm holding it up to the camera just now. It's a fantastic resource, a fantastic key um, that I've had some experience using in previous jobs that I've held um, while I've been running pond dipping sessions for young children. It's a fantastic resource and a great introduction to freshwater invertebrates, which is why I've decided that this is a fantastic tool to use for this presentation. It is only an introduction. I should um, point out that many of the animals, many of the groups that you're going to identify, that we're going to identify today, or that you're going to be able to identify using this key, will get you down to family, or order or sometimes even only phylum. So it's not going to get you down to species level for many creatures. Um, if you are wanting to do that, you are going to need to look um, deeper uh, for more resources. I'm going to highlight some other resources that you can uh, look further into at the end of this presentation if you're keen to um, get into this topic in more detail. Um, if you do have any questions, like I said, I'm prepared to answer them at the end of the presentation if I can. If I'm not able to answer them, um, then I will endeavour to get you an answer or put you in touch with somebody who will be able to answer the question that you have. So you will have to bear with me. Um, if I'm unable to, then I'll do my best to, to get you an answer as soon as I can. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about bug life. Um, we're the only organisation in Europe concerned with the conservation of all invertebrates. Our main aims are to halt invertebrate extinctions and achieve sustainable populations in the UK. We achieve these aims by mobilising and inspiring others, by undertaking practical conservation tasks, by shaping the development of relevant legislation and policy, and by raising awareness and promoting the value of invertebrates. So in freshwater habitats, the majority of, of the 126,000 animals are invertebrates. There are 4,133 invertebrate species that spend at least part of their life cycle in freshwater. It's recognised as the ecosystem with the highest level of biodiversity. Despite covering only 1% of all land, it is still home to almost 10% of all known species in the world. Scotland is where 90% of Britain's surface water can be found, mainly in the lochs and rivers that we have. So this is really a stronghold for freshwater habitats in the UK. So what are the benefits of freshwater invertebrates within these habitats? Freshwater invertebrates provide three crucial ecosystem services. Number one, they can clean the water. Some beetle larvae, for example, will actively break down and filter organic matter, playing a vital role in the nutrient cycle. Filter feeders such as black flies can remove microscopic particles harmful to the ecosystem. The second ecosystem service they provide is that they form the base of what is often a complex food chain, benefiting all life further up the chain, including otters, which are dependent on fish, and also benefiting humans for the same reason. So whilst we're fishing or farming um, for fish, we're reliant on the invertebrates that are feeding those fish. And the third ecosystem service that they provide is that many invertebrates act as biodiversity indicator species due to their specific habitat requirements. So for example, if certain species begin to die off, this may indicate that water quality has been affected by a pollution incident. So what are the threats to what are the threats to freshwater life in freshwater habitats? The most obvious threat perhaps is pollution. Um, pollution can occur in various different ways, including agricultural and urban runoff. This includes the use of pesticides in farming, domestic and industrial sewage effluents, 
and microplastics from household and cosmetic products. Other threats include invasive non-native species, for example, this North American signal crayfish pictured on the slide here, which is a voracious predator feeding on many smaller invertebrates in our ecosystem. Climate change is another threat that, that, pose, that is posed to the freshwater habitats as well as all other habitats on Earth. As many of you will already know, I'm sure warmer water carries less oxygen, which is obviously a serious problem for species that are dependent on high oxygen levels, high, oxy high oxygen content within the water. Another issue is um, potentially overlooking temporary marginal habitats, which, which would support often rare and vulnerable invertebrate life. So this might happen during the development process for new building um, proposals when, uh, when habitats tend to be overlooked and destroyed. So a little bit about the taxonomy of some of the groups that we're going to be looking at. The groups of invertebrates we're going to focus on today primarily belong to these main phyla within macroinvertebrates. So we're going to be looking at mollusks, which include the bivalves and gastropods. We're going to be including arthropods. Arthropods are a massive phylum, including the amphipods and the huge order of insects. We're also going to be talking in a, a very small amount of detail about a number of other phyla, including the platyhelminthes, the flatworms, nematoda, roundworms, annelida, segmented worms and leeches, as well as a few more phyla that aren't actually pictured in this diagram here, the Nid Nidaria, the hydra, nematomorpha, hairworms and nemertia, the ribbon worms. So many of these groups I'm really not going to discuss in any great detail. I don't have any expertise or much experience in many of these groups, so I'm going to be briefly commenting on them and where they fit into the freshwater name trail so that you're, you're able to identify them to, to phylum level at the very least. Um, and like I said, if you're, if you're wishing more detail, then you can, you can look um, further into the particular subjects that you're interested in. So I've already made reference to it, the Freshwater Name Trail, the Field Studies Council key. As you can see from this slide here, it folds out. It's a fairly simple um, picture key that's very easy to work through with children. And there's also a great deal of information on the other side of it. So it's an excellent resource for children and adults alike. For those of you that have never used a key before, it's particularly useful because it's a simple introduction to the use of keys. You start at uh, the left hand side over where it says the freshwater name trail and you can ask one question at a time for which there are yes and no answers and then move on to the next question. So hopefully using this process, you'll be able to identify most freshwater invertebrates that you encounter, certainly in garden ponds and generally in most freshwater habitats in the UK. So I'm going to be working through this uh, name trail uh, one stage at a time. And the first stage, as you can see, is over on the left hand side where it says start here. And I've recreated it for the purposes of this presentation. Does it live in a case or a shell? Yes or a no? Um, so if it does, then does the case have leaves, twigs, sand or stones? So when using a key, this is the process that you need to go through and you branch off in different directions. You get to the next question. Um, if it does, um, make a case are made of leaves, twigs, sand or stones, then it's a cased caddisfly larva. If it doesn't, then it's going to belong to the phylum of mollusks. If it doesn't live in a case or shell, then we're going to move on to the next slide after we've covered the first two topics here. So the phylum mollusca, as I said earlier, covers two different classes, two groups of animals. Firstly, the bivalves and then the gastropods. Bivalves quite literally means two shells. Gastropods have one shell. The bivalves are filter feeders. Um, 
most of which are marine, but some may be encountered in fresh water, including peacockles, which are pictured here. Peacockles are tiny but widespread. Um, freshwater mussels are also included in this group. Uh, they might include swan mussels, which can be up to 20 centimetres and are often found in lakes and rivers, and freshwater pearl mussels, which have historically had economic value. Gastropods, as many of you will already know, um, include the snails and slugs. Um, there are actually about 4,000 species of snail worldwide. They're very widespread and pollution tolerant, often found grazing on algae, growing on the surfaces of other plants and rocks. There's two main types of snail that are likely to be encountered in regular ponds that you're likely to be looking in. The first is the great pond snail with a conical shell pictured on the left here. The second is the ram's horn snail with a circular shell on the right. So they're the two main kinds of snail that you're likely to encounter. The cased caddisfly larvae. There's 189 species of caddisfly in the UK. The cases are constructed from assorted material and aid in species identification. Those that live in ponds often use bits of vegetation and plant debris, whereas those that live in flowing water often use smaller items of sand and other materials therefore making them more streamlined and less likely to be washed away in the current. Larvae of case caddisfly larvae tend to be herbivorous. Caseless caddisfly larvae have large jaws and are often carnivorous. The cinnamon sedge is the most common and likely to be encountered in garden ponds. Um, they belong to the genus of Limnophilus. The adults are nocturnal and short-lived, so like many insects, they spend the majority of their life cycle underwater. So as you can see in the diagram on the left-hand side there, the variety of uh, case construction that you have is quite remarkable, and depending on the material that's being used will give you a good indication of what species of caddisfly it is that you have. Sorry to interrupt, Greg. Yes, my sir. Um, can you remute everybody? There's a bit of crackling come through from those that have got the mics yeah, muted. Sure. Okay, thanks. One moment. Um. It looks like everybody's muted now. Yeah, if I get any uh, if I get any crackling again, I'll um, I'll I'll try and remute everybody. But I uh, just need to start sharing content again. Bear with me. Okay, I'm assuming that you can see that. Uh, where was I? I was uh, leaving the case caddisfly larvae and on to the next section of the freshwater name trail. So it doesn't live in a case or shell. Does it have legs? Um, so yes or no question. If it does have legs, then we're going on to the next slide. But in this case, um, we're dealing with the creatures that we've encountered that don't have legs. And through a series of questions um, about the movement pattern, we're going to reach um, leeches, which have a very distinctive movement. Um, the shape of the body will indicate whether or not we've got a flatworm. Um, the number of segments within the body will give us an idea of what kind of worms we're encountering and whether or not we've actually got fly larvae. Flies belong to the class in the class insecta but as larvae, they only have pro legs. They don't have jointed legs, so they can often be mistaken for uh, for legless invertebrates. Um, 
and do they have tentacles at the end of their body? So many of these groups that we're going to cover on this particular slide here um, are are very superficially can be very similar, but are actually covered over a broad range of different phyla. So I'm going to cover them very briefly uh, because I don't have a great deal of experience working in them. I do. I can tell you that the name worm may refer to several different phyla. You've got flatworms, which are very simple organisms with no body cavity, uh, two distinctive eyes and a flattened body that um, enables them to be a lot more streamlined and able to live in flowing water. You've got hair worms, which are mostly very small and thread or hair like. Round worms or nematodes have been known to reach up to two meters, but are generally also very, very small. Their larvae are parasitic, but the adults are free flowing. Ribbon worms are also very, very small. True worms and leeches. True worms and leeches belong to the uh, phylum Annelida. Annelids uh, are characterized by having segmented bodies and are often very tolerant of water pollution. Of, there's over 700 species of leech in the world, 16 of which can be encountered in the UK. Most leeches are carnivorous, but some are parasitic, such as the medicinal leech, which is depicted here. So not all leeches actually live on mammalian blood. The next group that we're moving on to is the fly larvae, which, as I said earlier, belong to um, the class Insecta in an order of their own called Diptera. Diptera is a large order of insects which fly with only one pair of wings as adults. In the larval form, many are aquatic and are often tolerant of low oxygen levels and high levels of pollution. The rat-tailed maggot is a hoverfly larvae which has a tail it is adapted as a snorkel, which allows it easy access to the fresh air above polluted water. Cranefly larvae have a distinctive star-shaped appendage near the end. Non-biting midge larvae, such as this red bloodworm on the top right there, are well known for being present in water where many other animals cannot survive. Biting midge larvae tend to be longer and thinner than non-biting midge larvae and are often seen thrashing about when observed in pond dipping trays. Phantom midge larvae are also known as glass worms and are spectacular creatures due to their transparency with their eyes and air sacs clearly visible. So on to the next section of the name trail. We've um, moved on to animals with legs now. Does it have more than six jointed legs? If it doesn't have more than six jointed legs, then that would suggest that it's, it belongs to the class Insecta, which we're going to move on to in the next, the next section of the name trail. But for now, uh, we're going to deal with the animals that have more than six jointed legs, uh, one of which is the arachnids, which we'll come to in a moment. And the others all belong to the crustaceans. So. The crustaceans include the crayfish, the shrimp, and the freshwater hoglouse. And I'll start with freshwater hoglouse. Um, freshwater hoglouse are a type of crustacean called isopods. So crustaceans are all characterized by having two pairs of antennae. You'll find that hoglouse, shrimp, and crayfish all have two pairs of antennae. Um, the isopods are uh, well isopod translated from greek directly means equal footed so basically they have the same legs all over the body um, we'll come back to that in the next slide they're essentially aquatic woodlice very closely related to woodlice and are very useful in that they feed on and digest ro digest rotting vegetation, thereby cleaning the pond they're in. So they're, they're excellent uh, cleaners of their habitat. There's two species to look out for in the UK, 
um, which can be separated quite simply using a hand lens by looking at the shape of the line behind the head. You can see in the diagram in the center of this slide, the one on the left has an M-shaped line at the back of the head on the right-hand side of that first diagram, whereas the diagram on the right has a straight line. So you're looking for that M shape, and the M shape will indicate that you've got a two-spotted or uh, two-spotted hoglouse or Azalus aquaticus, um, which is by far the more common hoglouse, the more common freshwater hoglouse you're going to encounter in most garden ponds. The much rarer, um, less likely to be encountered, but still possible, is the one-spotted um, hoglouse, so the Proazalus meridianus. So that's the one with the straight line. As the names would suggest, the two-spotted and one-spotted can be an indication as well, but often the two spots can be merged in the centre, so it's not always that obvious. Moving on to the next next group of crustaceans, the amphipods. So with the hoglouse, they belong to the group isopods. Amphipods, translated from uh, Greek, means two kinds of legs. So this, uh, or different footed rather, they do have two kinds of legs, five pairs for walking at the front of the body and three pairs for swimming at the back of the body. So another member of the amphipods would be uh, lobsters, for example, that, that look very sim similar in, uh, in, in morphological structure to, uh, to freshwater shrimps. Um, also known as side swimmers due to their habit of swimming on their sides when observed in a pond dipping tray. Uh, they're the most common. The most common shrimp found in British freshwater ponds is actually a North American species, Crangonyx pseudogracilis. Although this isn't thought to have had a negative impact on many of the habitats that it has been introduced to, there are a couple of invasive non-native species of shrimp that have been introduced to the UK that are of particular concern, and their names are demon shrimp and killer shrimp. They're already present in England and are steadily moving northwards, threatening much of the freshwater life that they're coming into contact with. Killer shrimp, for example, are thought to be one of the most damaging invasive species in Europe, given its tendency to kill everything and not always eat what it's killed. So they are, they are quite literally killers. And uh, as a result, they can cause a great deal of damage to the habitats that they're invading. There's a great deal more detail available on the killer shrimps and demon shrimps, as well as on the zebra mussels and a little bit of information on the North American signal crayfish um, in tomorrow's presentation with Joe Long from SEPA, which is about the invasive non-native species of potential concern in Scotland. So if you are interested in invasive non-native species and would like to know more, uh, there are still a couple of places available on tomorrow's event at 10 o'clock. And for more details, you can visit the Eventbrite page, the Bug Life Eventbrite page, and book your place. I think there's a, there, there are a few slots left still. So I'll share a link to that, that talk, the Eventbrite page, at the end of the presentation. So for anybody that would like to book onto that, you'd be more than welcome to. OK, moving on to the freshwater crayfish. Um, crayfish prefer cleaner flowing water, but can also be found in lochs and ponds. They're more often found in streams and rivers. There are no native species of crayfish, in, uh, of freshwater crayfish in Scotland, but two have been introduced. The first is the white clawed crayfish, which has been introduced from England and Wales and is now present in a couple of locations in Scotland. Uh, the second is North American signal crayfish, which has been introduced as an, an invasive non-native throughout the UK. Stocks of the white clawed crayfish in Scotland are thought to potentially have some conservation value as the latter spreads the crayfish plague, as the North American signal crayfish spreads the, cr the crayfish plague among native stocks further south. In addition to passing on the lethal fungal infection, they are also voracious predators that can cause significant damage to riverbanks as they burrow into them. So they can really damage the habitat that they've been introduced to, and they're a serious problem. 
Sightings of the North American signal crayfish do need to be reported whenever they're encountered to SEPA. Um, there is uh, more information available on the North American signal crayfish through SEPA's website and in the, the talk tomorrow with Joe Long. So again, I would encourage you to attend that if you're interested in learning a little bit more. One of the main strongholds of the North American signal crayfish in Scotland is actually in Gall in one location in Galloway, but they are found in various locations around the country. So moving away from crustaceans and onto the arachnids, our eight-legged creatures in pond habitats. Um, the first I'm going to cover is the diving bell spider, which is perhaps one of the most fascinating of all the freshwater invertebrates we're going to cover. It's the only species of spider that's known to spend almost all of its life underwater. They can do this by replenishing an underwater bubble net uh, with air trapped between hairs on their legs and body, which they carry from the surface down to these underwater bubbles. From this diving bell that they've created, they're able to hunt, eat, rest and reproduce. They often have a silvery appearance due to the air that they've got trapped in the hairs on their legs and body, um, creating a, a silvery film around them. So, uh, so that's why they might appear to be this silvery little uh, arachnid swimming in the water. They're quite scarce in Scotland, with only a handful of sites in Dumfries and Galloway and in the Highlands, although they are more common further south in England and Wales, but a very exciting record if you do encounter them in Scotland. Water mites are the tiny cousins of spiders, um, carnivorous arachnids that tend to be more parasitic in their larval form. They can also tolerate poor water quality, where they can often be abundant. Other animals may not survive such poor water quality. Remarkably little is known about the number of species of water mite in the UK or indeed in the world. So there's plenty of scope here for further research. I listened to a talk by Chris Catrin, a spider specialist from the British Arachnological Society. And uh, that's they, they were his words um, about water mites, is that very little is actually known about them, um, even down to the number of species that we have here. So um, yeah, lots, lots more to learn about them. On to the next part of the freshwater name trail. Um, and we've got to the stage there. We're at our class insecta now. So we know that they have six legs. Do they have one or more tails? Uh, we've got to check the number of tails that they have. Um, does it have more than one tail? If no, is the tail feathery? Uh, if yes, then we're looking at an older fly larva. <coughs> Or water bugs. Ooh. So I'm I'm buzzing through these slides quite quickly to give you an idea of the process in which you go through in order to use a key. And each question you get to, you have a yes or no answer. And then if you've answered no to does it have two tails, and you move on to are the tails longer than the width of the body. So each question will lead you to a potential answer. And all keys are very similar to this, except that many keys are a lot more complex, clearly. Um, but I'm, I'm buzzing through it very, very quickly. If you do want to study the freshwater name trail in more detail, it is available from various outlets online, including the, Fresh, the Field Studies Council's website directly. So it's only about three or four pounds. It's not a very expensive resource and it's very interesting to have a look at. So. As you can see, as you've gone through these questions, they are all relating to the number of tails and what the tails look like, whether the animals have gills. Um, does, does it have two tails? If they do have two tails, are the tails more than half as long as the body? If that's yes, then they're stonefly nymphs. If it's no, do the short tails end in hooks? If they do, then they're caseless caddisfly larvae. If you think back to the, the cased caddisfly larvae, the caseless caddisfly larvae also fall in this category with the other insects. If no, then you've got beetle larvae. So I'm going to uh, briefly address each of these groups and then we'll move on to the next part of the freshwater name trail. 
Firstly, older fly larvae. Older flies are voracious predators in their larval form and are dependent on cleaner oxygenated water, which, which is the case, I should say, for many of the insect larvae um, that are dependent on cleaner water with higher oxygen content. They have a single tail and sharp pincer-like jaws. They can easily be confused with some beetle larvae, but they have characteristically fine gills protruding from the sides of the abdomen. Most, most common of the older fly larvae is the mud older fly, which emerges as an adult in the spring and tends to fly during the day. Just before I go on with the insects, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that some of these are larvae and some of them are nymphs and just briefly clear up the, the basic difference between larvae and nymph. So an insect larvae, um, the, the most basic form of, uh, of differentiating a larva from, uh, from a nymph is that larvae don't resemble the adults at all and go through um, a pupa stage before emerging as adults, whereas nymphs, so for example a dragonfly, um, would uh, emerge from its nymph form into its adult form. So nymphs tend to resemble adults but with undeveloped wings, whereas larvae don't resemble adults at all and then pupate. So one in their in their pupa form um, in, in the chrysalis, they have to reorganize many of their body parts in order to emerge as an adult. So that's the basic difference between uh, larvae and nymphs. So moving on to beetle larvae. Um, beetles are the largest order of all animals in the world. There's approximately 400,000 uh, coleopterans or beetles um, known, which represent about a quarter of all known animals, which is a remarkable statistic. They're found in all habitats except heavily polluted water. Um, diving beetles belong to a family of beetles called um, Dytiscidae. Dytiscidae are, uh, are, are a, a wide group of beetles in themselves, but the, uh, the most common of which would be the great diving beetle. Um, but all diving beetles are known to be fierce predators and they, the great diving beetle particularly has large pincer-like jaws um, and they're lacking external gills that the older fly larvae have. So that's the that's the first thing that you need to look at between the older fly larvae and a beetle larvae is uh, does it does it have the gills on the side of the uh, on the side of the abdomen? So moving on to stonefly nymphs, you'll notice the these are nymphs rather than larvae, which mean that they do loosely resemble the adults but with undeveloped wings. For stoneflies, there are 34 species in the UK, 29 of which can be found in Scotland. They have two thin thread-like tails. They're also carnivorous with powerful jaws. With a hand lens, you can study the ends of their legs, their feet, where you can see two hooks in this uh, the bottom picture on this slide. You can just make out those two hooks, um, which helps to distinguish them from um, the superficially similar mayfly. Another thing that you could look for to separate them from mayfly um, is that they, they tend to have much longer antennae. Um, they, often prefer, they often prefer flowing water where they may be found hiding under rocky substrates. So stoneflies are one of the river flies, the, or so-called river flies, because they do prefer flowing water, although they can also be found in, um, in pond habitats from time to time. While we're on the subject of stoneflies, I'd like to draw your attention to uh, the Northern February Red Stonefly uh, Citizen Science Project that Bug, uh, Bug Life has had running for a couple of years now. I, I, I believe it's, it's at least a year old, but uh, the project is um, continuous. So we are encouraging as many members of the public to get involved and assist us with the uh, biological recording of the Northern February Red Stonefly, which is endemic to the UK and has a particular stronghold in the north of Scotland, although it can be found in other locations in Scotland too. 
In order to assist us with national monitoring, you can follow these three simple steps. Firstly, you can check fence posts along the side of a river in February and March if you're out walking at all um, to see if the fence posts have any stoneflies on them. If they do have stoneflies, take a picture. And then all you need to do with that picture is you need to send it to scotland at buglife.org.uk. Please include the subject stonefly, your name, the photo date, the name of the river, and preferably the location in grid reference form if possible, or um, a dot on a map, or you know, as close to being accurate as possible would be very useful. Uh, alternatively, you can tweet at Bug Life Scotland with all the relevant information there as well. Um, but the more people get involved, the better um, we'll up begin to understand the, the true distribution of this particular species of stonefly. Moving on to uh, mayfly nymphs, also loosely resembling the adults, but with undeveloped wings. Um, Nymphs are distinguished with three thread-like tails, very long, thin tails, as you'll notice in these uh, pictures here on the slide. Only one hook is um, present on the feet instead of two hooks, like in the case of the stonefly uh, nymph. You can just about make out the one hook in the picture on the left-hand side there. Uh, mayfly nymphs have prominent gills down the side of their abdomen, much like the older fly larvae. Um, they're herbivorous, herbivorous and reliant on very good water quality. And as a result, this makes them a very good um, biodiversity indicator species. So if we have lots of mayfly larvae, the, uh, mayfly nymphs, then we know that we've got um, reasonably clean water. Adults can be quite spectacular looking. Many species of mayflies are, uh, are very impressive in their adult form and they hold their wings vertically at rest, as you can see on this diagram on the right hand side. And they, they can hatch en masse as well, so uh, it can be encountered in large numbers through the spring and summer months. So moving on to the next part of the, oh, sorry. Uh, skipped a slide there. Uh, before we move on, the uh, damselfly nymphs are the, the next section. Um, damselflies belong to a suborder within the order Odonata, so they're the, the first suborder of Odonata being Zygopterans. Zygopterans are well, all Odonata species of voracious predators. Um, they have incredibly well adapted uh, they have an incredibly well adapted facial mask which extends rapidly from the lower jaw to pierce and consume their prey. You can see in the the illustrations on sorry the, the, the pictures on the right hand side of this slide an example of how they uh, extend their lower jaw in order to feed on their prey species. It's really quite a remarkable adaptation. Nymphs also have three tails like the mayfly nymphs but these are feather-like, distinguishing them from mayflies. So uh, the, the best illustration of that is on the, the picture on the left-hand side of this slide here, where you can quite clearly see the feather-like tails, as opposed to the long thread-like tails on the mayfly nymph here. They're also not tolerant of polluted water, so are another very good biodiversity indicator species. If you've got lots of damselfly nymphs in your pond, then you know that you've got reasonably good water quality in that pond. There's 21 species of damselfly in the UK, of which eight species occur in Scotland. The northern damselfly is actually endemic to Scotland and classified as endangered due to habitat loss and um, isolation. So they're now restricted to only a few sites in Speyside, Deeside and Perthshire and are subsequently quite a difficult species to see. So now we're going to move on to the next section, um, which is also dealing with um, animals with uh, six legs, but we're firstly going to look at whether or not they live on the surface. So if they do live on the surface, surface living animals, like I said, many parts of the freshwater name trail aren't going to get you very close to species, but they are going to help you identify what you're looking at. So this surface living animal group we're going to cover in one moment. If they don't live on the surface, can you see uh, body segments on the back of the abdomen? 
If yes, does it have short, stubby wings? If yes, then we're going to be covering the other suborder within the order Odonata, the dragonfly nymphs. If no, do the short tails end in hooks? Then we've got caseless caddisfly larvae again, which will obviously key out to different locations. They can be quite confusing larvae to identify. Um, and also beetle larvae as opposed to, um, well, beetle larvae that we covered earlier as well. But um, going back to the body segments, if you can't see the body segments, do the wings overlap diagonally? If they don't, then we're looking at water beetles. Uh, if they do, uh, does it swim on its back? If yes, we've got a greater water boatman. If no, we've got a lesser water boatman. So we're going to go through each of these groups individually, starting with the surface dwellers, the surface living animals. So the most obvious of the surface dwellers eh, are the, the hemipterans uh, or the true bugs uh, of the, the order hemiptera. Um, we have the pond skaters, water measurers and water crickets all of which live on the water surface. They all have hydrophobic or water-fearing hairs on their feet, enabling them to use the water tension to walk on the water. All hunt by sensing the vibrations of animals falling into the pond or water and then rush to the prize, often in large numbers. So if a small animal was to fall into a pond, then you would quite often, if there were a lot of pond skaters about, you would quite often see all of the pond skaters darting towards that prey as quickly as possible and feeding on, on mass. Another uh, animal that's likely to live on the water surface and is also very, very well adapted to life on the water surface is the whirligig beetle. Um, uh, readily identifiable due to its erratic swirling movement on the surface. Um, they're very well adapted due to their uh, two pairs of eyes. They have a pair of eyes for seeing above the water and a pair of eyes for seeing below the water. Uh, I think you can see my cursor at the moment. I hope so. But if you look at the picture, um, the close up of the water beetle's head, of the whirligig beetle's head on the right hand side, you can see the fur, the upper eye for seeing above the water and the lower eye here for seeing underneath the water. Quite a remarkable adaptation. Springtails may also be encountered on the surface of the water. And despite being tiny, they also have a very distinctive springing movement, which they achieve by releasing their tail, which is typically held under tension. So this gives them their, uh, their common name, springtails. Uh, like I said, very, very small, but quite easily identifiable due to their, um, their characteristic movement. The next group I'd like to cover are the water beetles, as opposed to the water beetle larvae. Um, we're now dealing with the beetles in their adult form. But firstly, I think it's important to describe the difference between Coleoptera and Hemiptera in their adult form. And uh, one very easy way to differentiate between Coleoptera and Hemiptera is to look at the shape of the elytra or the wing case on the back of the animal. If you can see the T shape on the left hand photograph at the top of this slide, then you're looking at a Coleoptera. If you can see an X or a Y shape, as is the case in the shield bug in the center there, um, or the leaf bug in the right hand side, then they're true bugs, hemipterans. So you're looking for that X or Y or the T shape, which will help you differentiate between Coleoptera and Hemiptera. And we'll look at um, some Hemipterans in the, the next slide. But the most common of the water beetles, as I mentioned earlier in their larval form, is the great diving beetle, um, which is usually near the top of any food chain of which it's a part in any um, garden pond that you may be encountering. Um, because they can mainly because they can grow to over two inches, they, they can be enormous and uh, voracious predators. The males have suction cups on their front legs, which they use to catch prey and hold on to it while they're eating it, and also to hold on to females while they're mating. So uh, another useful adaptation for, for life in the pond. 
Um, many water beetles will take a bubble of air below the surface, which they will use to breathe from while they're underwater, and they'll also use as a buoyancy aid um, whilst underwater. So effectively, they're using a bubble of air in the same way that humans might use um, scuba diving equipment to remain under the water for longer. So moving on to the water boatmen. Uh, which also belong to this order of insects, the Hemiptera. And you can see quite clearly, if I skip back to that slide there, and you look at the X and the Y on those two examples of Hemipterans, land Hemipterans there, um, then we're looking at aquatic Hemipterans here in the greater water boatman and the lesser water boatman. And if you look at the bottom right picture, you can quite clearly see the X on the elytra or the wing case on the back of the lesser water boatman there. And you can quite quite clearly see what, well, what I would describe as a Y in the top left image on this slide here as well, the greater water boatman. So that helps you readily identify these as hemipterans, true bugs. Um, so of the two species of water boatman, um, we have the greater water boatman firstly, which is, as the name would suggest, larger than the lesser water boatman. Um, they're also known as back swimmers, often swimming upside down and very close to the water surface, as you can see from the bottom left image on the slide here. Um, so they're, they're swimming just underneath the water surface in the same way that the other hemipterans, the pond skaters, for example, are swimming just on this top surface of the water. And they're waiting to feel vibrations on the water surface of animals falling into the water as well and then darting to those to those prey, to those victims to, to feed on. And they feed on them by uh, injecting a toxic saliva, which partially digests the prey before uh, consuming them by sucking the, the liquefied contents of that prey species. Um, so it's a, a very gruesome way of feeding on the, the prey that they're, they're, they're eating. But uh, lesser water boatmen, in contrast, are actually herbivorous with blunted mouth parts. So unlike the other hemipterans that we've already discussed, uh, they, they actually are herbivorous. Um, both species of water boatmen have elongated uh, rear leg parts. So the, the rear legs are elongated to act as um, paddles or oars, which gives them their, their common name, the water boatman, um, which makes them easily rec recognizable when they're swimming around in a pond. But uh, they are actually the, the, rear, the rear pair of legs that, that assist in swimming. So the last group of insects that I'm going to describe are the dragonfly nymphs, the uh, the, the suborder of Odonata Anisoptera. Um, Anisoptera are much larger and bulkier than their smaller cousins, the Zygopterans. Um, they are also predatory, however, and like the great diving beetle, are often top of the pond food chain in which they live. They have big bulging eyes and very short stumps rather than actual tails. Adults emerge after about two years underwater and spend little more than a few weeks on the wing. So much like many other aquatic insects, um, they'll spend most of their lives in the water before hatching and flying for just a short time um, before the end of their lives, laying eggs in the fresh water and then dying off. As they emerge from the freshwater, they do leave behind an excuvier, which is depicted in the, the central image on this slide here. The excuvier is the shell or case of the last um, nymphal stage of the, the dragonfly before it hatches and expands its wings, as you can see on the, the image on the right hand side. That's a very fresh looking dragonfly that has just emerged from its excuvier and is waiting to uh, have enough energy and to pump uh, enough fluid into its wings in order to enable it to fly. Um, the excuviae themselves are usually the first indication that you have dragonflies or damselflies in the pond before you even go pond dipping. If you encounter these excuviae, then you'll um, stand a good chance of actually identifying what species of dragon or damselfly you have existing in the pond habitat that you're looking at. Um, so they can be quite fascinating to, uh, to look further into. Um, and yeah, like I said, top of, top of any food chain that they are part of. So 
as I said at the beginning of the presentation, it is very much an introduction to life in freshwater um, using this uh, this excellent resource, the Freshwater Name Trail. I I hope the those of you that haven't seen this before have been uh, sufficiently inspired to go out and have a look for it yourself. Because uh, if you are planning on doing any pond dipping or are involved in leading any pond dipping workshops with uh, children or are just interested in doing it personally, then um, the Freshwater Name Trail is the best resource you could uh, look for in order to guide you through um, the general groups that you're going to be encountering. There are many other resources available that you can search for online, including these three books that are featured on this slide here, The Freshwater Life of Britain in Northern Europe, The Guide to Freshwater Invertebrates, and The Key to the Major Groups of British Freshwater Invertebrates, which is also produced by the Field Studies Council. Um, all of these go into a great deal more detail and in some cases will enable you to get down to species level in your identification, which will be much more useful in terms of your biological recording. There are other field guides available as well into specific groups such as um, damsels and dragons, like this uh, this field guide that I'm holding up to the camera, um, the field guide to the dragonflies and damselflies of Great Britain and Ireland, which is a very useful resource if you're wishing to identify your damselflies and dragonflies, but won't be much use to you with um, with the other pond species that you might encounter. In terms of recording, in Bug Life we always encourage people to use iRecord um, wherever possible. iRecord is a very useful app that's available to download onto your smartphones from many apps, from all app stores. Um, the data that you input to iRecord is picked up and verified by various uh, recording schemes nationally and then subsequently fed into the NBN Atlas, the National Biodiversity Network Atlas. The NBN Atlas is an excellent resource for looking up species information, including status and distributions. So um, if you think you've encountered a species but aren't sure, then I would recommend the first thing that you do is type in that particular species into the NBN Atlas and have a look at that species status and distribution and see how likely it is that you're going to have encountered it in your particular area. Um, it's worth doing that before you input it into iRecord. And if it's very unlikely, then you might need to seek uh, specialist advice or do a little bit more research before reporting that particular sighting that you've had. So that's all I'm going to say this morning. Uh, I've reached the end of the presentation. I hope you enjoyed uh, the slides and the information that I had to share with you. Um, I am happy to answer any questions that I'm able to. As I said at the beginning, my uh, my level of expertise is limited in much of this field. So if I am unable to answer any questions, I can certainly endeavour to put you in touch with somebody that would be able to. But uh, but I am happy to hear any questions that you have and um, uh, listen to any points or comments that any of you may have. So. I'm going to stop sharing my screen just now. <laughs> OK, and as I said at the beginning um, of the presentation, you are welcome to use the conversation box. Uh, very nice comment from Kirsty. Thank you very much, Kirsty. Uh, particularly enjoyed the interesting tidbits of information. <laughs> Excellent, glad to hear it. Um, so I am going to share a little bit of information on the conversation box just now. Uh, just to let you know 
there the as i as i said at the beginning this presentation has been recorded and it will be available to look back through so all of this information is going to be available on the bug life website and on our youtube channel in due course so hopefully by the end well hopefully by next week it will be available online for you to look back through if there's any information on in any of the slides that you would like some uh, reminder of then um, then you can look back through it yourselves um, keep an eye on that. I'm going to share some information before I start losing a few of you. I'd like to copy and paste, uh, firstly, uh, SurveyMonkey. So if you could have a look, um, if you could have a look at this SurveyMonkey and it will take you no more than two minutes to fill in. There's only four questions. We're just looking for a little bit of feedback, particularly in terms of the location from which you're attending the, the event and also how you found it generally. So um, if you wouldn't mind uh, clicking on that survey monkey and just spend spending two minutes to answer the four questions that we're asking. Um, uh, Roddy's just asked uh, a very useful and informative presentation. Will the PowerPoint be available on the Bug Life website? I'm not going to make the PowerPoint available, Roddy, but as I said, the recording will be available both on YouTube and through the Bug Life website. So um, the best thing that I would recommend is search for Introduction to Freshwater Invertebrates on the Bug Life YouTube channel. If if you're on, if you visit YouTube and then search for Bug Life. Then you'll get to the Bug Life channel, and then by next week we should have the video uploaded, um, and then you'll be able to look through the presentation yourself and scan through it on YouTube and um, see which whichever bits of information you want to remind yourself of. Um, there is one other bit of information I would like to share with you before I start losing everybody, and that is the link to tomorrow's event. Um, so, as I mentioned during the presentation, Joe Long from SEPA has very kindly agreed to come along and join us for what I believe is going to be a very interesting presentation about um, the invasive non-native freshwater species in Scotland. So this is this is taking uh, this is taking a closer look at some of those species that I made reference to the killer shrimp, demon shrimp, both of which aren't actually in Scotland at the moment, but could pose a serious, are posing a serious threat already in England where they do exist. And um, I, I'll be honest, I didn't know a great deal about killer shrimp or demon shrimp um, a couple of months ago, but I've learned a good bit um, over the last month or so during the research. And I'm really looking forward to listening to what Joe's got to say on these species as well as zebra mussels and, um, and the North American signal crayfish. So, uh, if you do want to book onto that, there's, a, there's actually only five spaces left available. I've limited that to 50 attendees. So anybody that's interested, um, I would get in there quickly and, and book your place. Thanks very much, Lorna. Uh, yeah, a few very uh, positive comments and feedback. Thank you very much all for uh, for those kind words. Um, yeah, like I said, if you uh, if you'd be happy enough just to spend a couple of minutes clicking on that survey monkey link and completing that questionnaire, it's only only four questions and it won't take you um, more than two minutes to to complete. Uh, Carol's asked, where can I find out more about the habitat needs of individual species? Um, Carol, the first on the in the first instance, I would refer you directly to the Bug Life website. Um, on our website, we do have information on creating garden ponds and how to um, enhance your particular pond to benefit freshwater life. Um, there are a couple of other organisations that. Uh, you might be interested in tapping into and one, one of them is Pond Life. Pond Life are an excellent charity with a great deal of information in terms of um, habitat creation, pond creation, and they can provide you with, their, their website can provide you with lots of information relating to 
to suitable plants, uh, filtration systems and all sorts of other information that um, would help you uh, make decisions on how to uh, create the best um, garden pond possible. So hopefully that's uh, that's enough for you to be uh, getting on with. I'll see if I can find a link on the Bug Life website that I can share in the conversation. Um, Yeah, Carol. So, um, in, in the first instance, there's a there's a link to the Freshwater Hub on the Bug Life website, and if you visit if you visit that, then you'll get a great deal more information about many of the species that I've already introduced you to, as well as their habitat requirements and how you would uh, go about creating um, your own garden pond if you were keen to do so. Um, we just had a question come through from Jane. Has any research been done on the impact of dog and cat flea treatments on aquatic invertebrates? Um, Jane, I don't know the answer to that, I'm afraid. If you would like to um, wait until after the presentation, I will do a little bit of asking around within Bug Life and see if I can get a response and email you um, a, an answer to that question. I'm, I'm sure that one of my colleagues within Bug Life will have an idea of whether there has been any research done into into that impact, but uh, but I'll need to look into it and get back to you if you don't mind. Yeah, I think in the Freshwater Hub, Carol, you may well find information on um, managing wetland ditches as well as uh, garden ponds. So the, uh, the, the, I think the Freshwater Hub um, carries all, it covers all kinds of, uh, of freshwater habitats within the UK. Um, so hopefully there will be um, some information that's useful for you in there. Oh, thanks, Melissa. Um, Melissa's just shared a link to an article that uh, provides a little more information on Jane's inquiry. Um, which I'm going to find quite interesting as well. So thank you very much for that link, Melissa. Jane, if there is any more information that I'm able to dig up from uh, from uh, referring to my colleagues and I will email you um, whatever else I'm able to find.
Oh, fantastic. Thanks, Melissa. There's um, there's a little bit of further information as well that um, I, I wasn't actually aware of, but it's very useful information for those of you that are still on the chat. Um, we have a petition uh, set up through the UK government and parliament website um, to ban the use of many chemicals harmful to freshwater invertebrates. So Melissa shared the link if you are interested in reading that Guardian article and signing the petition, then uh, then you can do so using that link that Melissa shared. <laughs> 